the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. And I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just wonderful, because spring is here. Everything's turning green, the birds are singing, school will soon be over, flowers are beginning to flower, blossoms are beginning to blossom, and... And, uh, and, and butterflies uh, are beginning to butter, yes. You certainly are happy, <laughs> aren't you? If you'll just read me the funnies, it'll make everything... Perfect. Puck the comic weekly. Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Well, now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the top of the first page... Hop along, Cassidy. Which we will read right away. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. Rescued from the bog by the sheriff, Hoppy and his pals have ridden to the tax assessor's office to get Vane, the brains of the gang. Stealthily, Hoppy enters the office. He sees Vane going through the files. Vane says, You know, is that you, Sloat? Hoppy replies, Not this time, Mr. Prentice Vane, alias Peavy. Vane whirls around, first picture next row, and stammers, Oh, Cassidy, I thought you were... Dead. Sloat and his boys did their best, but luckily the sheriff showed up in time to pull us out of the oil bog. And California says... Man, as for your paid killers, they're running like scared rabbits with a posse breathing down their necks. Vane stammers, My paid killers? Why, I don't understand. Hoppy continues, first picture, next row. You understood a rich oil vein when you saw it. You found you couldn't steal the claim, so you decided to use Don Felipe to force the issue. Well, now the game's over. California says, Yeah, we've come for the boy. Vane says, ah, you win, gentlemen. You'll find him in that vault. All right, open it. And cover him, Lucky. Vane opens the door to the vault. First picture, fourth row. Hoppy and California go into the vault as Lucky stands guard. Lucky turns his head aside for a second. Quickly, Vane picks up a big dictionary and throws it at Lucky. Oof! Then quickly steps outside and slams the door of the vault closed. He picks up his box of money, throws a lamp on the floor, sets the office afire, first picture bottom row, then runs outside. He leaps in his buggy and drives off, saying, Now, to head for the old quarry works and silence Don Felipe, the last living witness against me. The building is on fire and Hoppy and his friends are locked in the safe. How will they ever get out? Well, that is a dangerous situation. I only hope that the safe is fireproof so they won't be burned to death. And now that Hoppy isn't free, that mean man's going to get rid of Felipe and there'll be nobody to rescue him. Well, next week we might have very exciting things happening that'll turn the tables on Mr. Vane. Oh, I certainly hope so because this is a terrible situation. Now, don't give up in dismay. Remember, Hoppy is a hero and maybe he'll find a way. But now what? Well, I, I think you better read Prince Valiant, because I'm sure he's on page three. Well, let's look and see. See? You're right, he is. <laughs> Prince Valiant, page three. And you remember last week, that poor boy, Arf, froze his feet when they crossed the mountains. Yes, and they came to a little town at the foot of the mountains. And the doctor told Val that he'd have to leave Arf there for a long time. And uh, Prince Val has to continue his journey, so I wonder what he did. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Prince Valiant to the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Val is faced with a problem. First picture, he's saying to his friends, Arf's feet are cr- frozen crossing the pass. 
Even now, he's fighting for his very life. Yet we have a mission to complete. Rufus and Egil agree. A quest is a quest. So they go to bid our farewell last picture top row, telling him they must continue their errand. But they promise to return when the work is finished. Arf understands and bravely nods his head, even though he hates to be left behind. First picture, next row. Val leaves a princely sum of money with the doctor to make sure of his young squire's care. And with all arrangements made, Val and his friends prepare to continue their journey. Paul, the guide from the monastery, is no longer needed now that he has shown Val the way across the mountains, and he turns homeward once more to pit his strength and skill against the perils of the pass with its bitter cold, its avalanches, and its chasms. Last picture of the row, Val, Egil, and Rufus speed on their way. The old Roman roads are good, but the weather is not. And first picture, bottom row, they reach the city of Rome, and through the mist and rain, see that the city is a place of ruin, scars of the vandals' visits still visible, ruin everywhere about them. They find an inn in the city, and there dismount, preparing to spend the night. Next morning, last picture, the sun is shining, the world looks brighter, and Val announces, Let's away to the bazaar and replace our travel-stained garments with raiment befitting ambassadors of Thule. What's a bazaar? A bazaar was a name used many years ago for a store where you could buy almost anything. Oh, I see. My goodness, everywhere they went, those barbarians just destroyed everything. Yes, the barbarians were cruel people who didn't respect anything that was good or nice. Well, next week, will we find out more about Val's quest? I think we will. Oh, I certainly won't miss that. We waited a long time for them to get there. Mm-hmm. Well, now while we're waiting for next week, how about reading Donald Duck? Oh, please. Very well, then. Turn over the page, and here he is on page five, and here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze it, ticket jack. Let's have music to better quack quack. Donald loads a ladder in his car, then jumps into the car and drives off. When Donald stops, he's at the city park. He takes the ladder out of the car, puts it against a lamppost, climbs the ladder, unscrews the light bulb from the lamppost in the last picture top row, climbs down the ladder, first picture bottom row, picks up the ladder, carries it to another lamppost, Sets the ladder up, climbs up the ladder, and unscrews the light bulb from the other lamppost. Climbs down the ladder, puts the ladder in the car, and drives home. When we see Donald again, it's evening, and he's all dressed up in a sporty checkered jacket, smart hat, and his squirting cologne all over himself. The last picture, Donald is with his girl Daisy in the park, on the bench. And neither of the street lights are on. And Daisy says, Marty, it's dark. And Donald says cheerfully, What romantic, huh, Toots? <laughs> Isn't that silly? <laughs> he was going on a date with his girl Daisy, so 
he screws the light out of the lamp post so it will be dark and romantic. <laughs> yes, this way no one will see him sitting on the bench with his girl, and then he won't be bashful about holding her hand. <laughs> no, he won't. Oh, Donald is so romantic. <laughs> yes. Well, now, how would you like to skip to... Oh, I'd love to if it's Dagwood and Bundy. Well, it is. <laughs> and here they are on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. And since you found them, we'll read them right away. So here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafoo, Ramafum, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. The alarm clock rings, waking Dagwood up. He shuts off the alarm, saying, Oh, boy, Sunday morning. I can turn off the alarm and sleep as long as I like. But just as he snuggles down again, Blondie asks, uh, Before you go back to sleep, dear, will you feed the pups and let them out? Dagwood puts on his bathrobe and toddles down the stairs, last picture, top row. Alexander, who's in his pajamas, calls, Oh, on your way up, Pop, will you please bring us some cinnamon toast and milk? And Dagwood thinks. <coughs> First picture, next row, Dagwood is setting out the dog's food. And he says, Now, I can get back in bed and go to sleep. What a delicious pup! <laughs> He gives the toast and milk to Alexander and Cookie. And just as he's about to climb into bed, Alexander calls, Well, thanks for the toast and milk, Pop. Whereupon Blondie sits up and says, Oh, how lovely, serving breakfast in bed. I'll have orange juice, egg, toast, and coffee. And Dagwood thinks, puts on his bathrobe, and trots downstairs again. Last picture of the row, he's frying eggs and says, Well, might as well make my own breakfast, too, while I'm up. First picture next row, after having his own breakfast, he hands Blondie a tray with hers, saying cheerfully, Now, go back to sleep. And Blondie says, You're a darling. Takes off his bathrobe, climbs into bed, and he's just going to snuggle down when Alexander runs in saying, Hey, Pop, Mr. Woodley's downstairs. He wants to borrow something. And Dagwood thinks and shouts, Tell him to take whatever he wants and let me go to sleep. A few minutes later, Dagwood hears an awful racket outside. And first picture bottom row, he sits up in bed and yells, Listen to that noise! It was my lawnmower he borrowed! And he jumps out of bed, dashes downstairs, out the door. And he grabs the lawnmower from Herb Woodley, gives it a mighty swing, and hits Herb Woodley on the head with it. Last picture, he's back in bed again. He's been trying to go to sleep. Finally, he sits up and snarls. I can't sleep thinking about how much it'll cost to repair the lawnmower. And Blondie says, Dagwood, you've kept me awake all morning. <laughs> oh, listen to her. She says he kept her awake all morning. It was she who made him get out of bed in the first place. Yes, it looks like Dagwood's Sunday has been spoiled. I'm afraid so, but wasn't it funny just the same? <laughs> and I think that bathrobe looks so silly. Yes, now read me Roy Rogers, please. Here he is, right under Dagwood and Blondie. I'll read that in just a moment, but first here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the first page of the second section, at the bottom, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. A yip I oh Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip I oh Roy and Doleful Hawkins succeeded in stomping the stampede of the cattle. They went off to look for Glib Mason, a citizen of Rawhide, friendly to Doleful, leaving Wildwood and her steer, Blackjack, to watch the herd. Stogie Grimes, the outlaw who escaped from Roy earlier, captured Wildwood and Blackjack and has taken them to an abandoned logging camp. 
He locks Wildwood up inside the shack. But who should ride up but Glib Mason? He dismounts and greets Stogie in a friendly way. Stogie says to him, third picture, top row, Glib Mason, well, I grabbed the gal and her critter like you said, boss. Glib Mason answers, Good, but Roy Rogers has been trailing me since I slipped away from the herd. Get your rifle. Quick! Meanwhile, Roy, who has been following Mason's track, says to Trigger, Well, Mason's trail leads to that old logging camp, Trigger. I have a hunch that promoter stampeded our herd and also knows what happened to Wildwood and Blackjack. Last picture, top row, Mason leads Stogie Grimes over to the edge of the cliff, saying... Roger's pal Hawkins is driving the herd to raw hide alone. We gotta stop him. Grimes replies, Yeah, well, first we gotta take care of Rogers. He goes on first picture, bottom row. We'll make plenty, Mason. You promoted money to finance the trail drive, and then you rustle the very steers you buy for the folks in Rawhide. Mason sees Roy coming up the road below, and he says, Quiet. Rogers is entering the ravine. I got an idea. We'll make this look like an accident. Roy rides up the bottom of the cliff, sees Mason's horse, and says, Hey, that's Mason's horse, Trigger. He can't be far away. I'll go up the bank and have a look. So he gets off Trigger and starts to climb up the bank directly below a flat car loaded with logs. At this moment, Stogie says to Mason, Hurry, cut the ropes. He's coming up the bank. Mason cuts the ropes quickly. And last picture, the logs roll off the flat car, thunder down toward Roy as Mason says, Stand back, Grimes. Rogers will be crushed to a pulp. Unless Roy thinks of something to save himself. But what can he do? I don't know. We'll just have to wait till next week to find out. Wait, wait, wait. That's all we do is wait, wait, wait. This is the most exciting time. I know, but that's one of the things that makes the funnies exciting. Yes, but the suspense is killing me. Well, let's go to Flash Gordon then before you die. Oh, yes. And he's right over the page, isn't he? Well, let's see. You're right. He is. Oh, and this I love because Flash is on the moon. And I've always wanted to go to the moon. Yes, Flash has gone to the moon to find out why the meteors which had been exploding on Earth had been dropping so regularly. And they discovered that the beetle men on the moon had been shooting the mate, um, mate, meteors at the Earth. And last week, Flash put their machine out of order. And then Flash and his friends hid with the beetle man who became their friend. And I wonder what's going to happen to... Well, let's find out right now. So here we go with Flash Gordon. rega rega doon doon Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash and his party watch in awe as their atom blast wrecks the cannon from which flaming meteors were hurtling from the moon to the earth. Beetle-like moon men pour angrily out of their burrows to find out what's happened. Last picture top row, as the beetle men swarm toward the space rocket, Flash frees his captive moon man and orders him to keep his people away from the ship. Tell them to stay where they are or I'll shoot. A warning ray blast emphasizes Flash's command. First picture, bottom row, Flash and his friends scramble into their space rocket. Flash says, we can't hold them off very long. We'll fake a retreat, hide the ship, and then come back later. Quickly, they enter the ship and take off. Just as the beetle men close in around it, the beetle men dance in triumph as the rocket roars away. But in the tunnel entrance, a mysterious figure seems grimly concerned. It's an Earth man who looks through his telescope at the disappearing rocket. Last picture, at Bright's request, Flash circles toward the dark side of the moon. Bright busies himself taking pictures, so he'll have a photographic record of the weird moonscape until Flash warns, We're heading into icy night. You better turn back to keep an eye on our playmates. 
That's what I'm wondering. He has a gun just like Flash. He's an Earthman, I'm sure. He must be a villain if he's the one who's been firing the meteors at the Earth. Yes, well, I hope Flash gets wise to him in a hurry. Ooh, so do I. Well, next week we really will have something to look forward to in Flash Gordon because this is something Flash hasn't expected. No. Well, now let's get over to the next page quickly because Dick is with George Washington's army. And we want to see what's happening to him. Yes, he's at Valley Forge, spending the cold, cold winter there with the American soldiers. And they must be going to have a battle soon, so quick, read it. All right, here we go with Dick's Adventures. And say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for Adventurous Dick. Valley Forge, the terrible winter is over. Sergeant Gunner Hayes, Dick's friend, confides joyfully to him. Hey, wonderful news. My wife Molly's on her way here for a visit, Dick. Molly? Molly Pitcher? Sergeant Hayes smiles at Dick and answers. Is her nickname, Dick. Molly, bring the pitcher her folks used to call her when she was little. Hey, how did you know? Dick says nothing, but just goes wisely about his business. Last picture, top row. Suddenly, that night, orders come to strike camp at once and march. Dick groans. Oh, your Molly will never find us now. But Sergeant Hayes laughs. Hey, I guess you don't know my Molly. No time at all. The Army's on the march. First picture, next row. Because an immense British force under General Clinton has bivouacked in Monmouth, New Jersey. Dick says, we're going to attack before they have a chance to move out. The attack begins at dawn. All through the next day, the furious battle of Monmouth rages in unbearable heat. Dick is covered with grime, burned with gunpowder. Washington himself rides through the Rhines, rallying his exhausted troops. New strength flows into the men when they see their brave commander cheering them on, and they fight with redoubled fury. Then, first picture bottom row, Sergeant Hayes shouts, Molly! Dick turns to see a young girl in silken ruffles coming toward them. It's Molly Pitcher. He tells them it took a long time to find them, and now that she's here, she wants help. The men need water to cool their parched, thirsty throats and to cool the hot cannon. So back and forth, under fire, Molly runs with a broken pitcher to a nearby brook, and Dick hears himself shouting, Hey, Molly, bring the pitcher! Molly, pitcher! And then Sergeant Hayes is struck by a shot from the enemy and falls to the ground wounded. And Molly, last picture, springs in to take his place at the cannon and fights beside Dick until the battle is won. Oh, wasn't she a brave woman? Oh, she certainly was. She was a great heroine. Just imagine that woman fighting beside all those men and firing that big cannon all by herself. Yes. Molly Pitcher was a very famous woman patriot. Will we hear more about her next week? Oh, I'm sure we will. You know, she helped win that battle. Oh, I'll be anxious to see more about her next week. Well, we will. And now look, right underneath Dick is Rusty Riley. And remember, a terrible thing happened last week. Yes, that mean man, Smith, drove the truck that Rusty and Tex were in across the bridge, and then he set the bridge on fire and ran away. Yes, and Rusty and Tex are stranded in the old lumber camp and can't get out. But one thing that Smith doesn't know is that the plans that he had stolen at the factory slipped out of his pocket, and Rusty has them now. But he's apt to go back after them. So let's go and see what happens with Rusty Riley. Say the magic words with me. Gallop and run run till the road road is dusty. dusty. Give Give us music music for his horse and Rusty. First picture, as Rusty looks at the bridge which has fallen into the river, he says, Golly, Tex, the bridge is nothing but smoke and ruins. How are we ever going to get away from here? Tex replies, well, you and I might find a way across that gorge, but we could never get Big Blaze over. 
But gee, Willikin sticks, what are we gonna do? We well, right off, I can't say, Rusty. But one thing I know, I'll never leave Blaze here. I'm responsible. And somehow I'm gonna get him home. Whatever we do, we better do it fast, because that hombre is sure to find out that those secret plans ain't in the back of that picture. Golly, you're right, Tex. And when he does, he'll be back, sure. Last picture top row. As Rusty looks at the huge logs lying around the lumber camp, he says, Tex, I, I was just thinking, those big logs must have been brought here somehow, and I don't think that bridge we came over would have been strong enough. Yeah, I see what you're getting at. Did shake a lot even under our van. Yeah, there must be another way. So they walk through the camp, looking around. First picture, bottom row, they see railroad tracks. Rusty exclaims, Hey, wait a second, Tex. How about these tracks? They must go somewhere. By Jingo, Rusty, I think you got something there. Come on. They lead around behind that shed. Quickly, they walk along the tracks. Rusty stops. Look, Tex. Another bridge. Tex says thoughtfully, A bridge ain't quite the word, Rusty. I'd call it a trestle. Mm, I'm afraid it ain't much help. We can't walk Big Blaze across that thing. Rusty looks back the other way and says, Well, in the other direction, the track runs right into a building. I wonder what's in there. He runs down the tracks, goes into the shed where the tracks end, and finds a train engine. Rusty exclaims, Gee, Willikins! Hey, Dex, come here! <laughs> And now they can put Blaze on the train, and then they can get away. And if that mean Smith comes back, he won't find them. Yes, if Tex can run that engine. Oh, I forgot. Maybe he can't. Oh, uh, do you think he can? Well, I'm afraid that's another thing we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Oh, all right, I'll be here. Well, don't sound so disappointed. You've got lots of other comics you can read all during the week. And don't forget, you can enjoy yourself with the Comic Weekly Corner. Oh, yes. And I can read Snuffy Smith and The Phantom and The Lone Ranger and, oh, lots of them. Of course you can. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice man with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Connie Bigley Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's the date. And the date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.